Okay, so I'm here to tell you about Chopsticks, which is a new library uh, I wrote uh, over the past year for um, running Python code on remote hosts. Um, I'm Daniel Pope. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, you can call me Daniel Sam. Um, we're uh, going to uh, go through um, what Chopsticks is, how to use it, and then take a little look at some of the tricks that make it work. So. Um, Chopsticks fundamentally allows you to run Python code on remote POSIX machines um, in parallel over SSH with nothing installed except the SSH server um, and, and Python, system Python. Um, so it behaves a lot like, I, I've been calling it multiprocessing over SSH for, for simplicity. Um, it can also do some uh, things with Docker, uh, so we'll explore some of the parallels between how I'm using SSH and how you can use Docker, sudo, and other things. This is uh, a chopsticks script, uh, so I'm importing a uh, my git management function, so there is, a, there is a git revision function somewhere in the code base. Uh, there is this group object, um, and I pass a list of strings, which uh, are so if, if you just pass strings, then they are host to SSH2, and then we can call that function uh, on all of the hosts and then loop over the results. Um, and I always like to show the, uh, the, the kind of implementation of the function, so that's how you might write a git revision. It's just subprocess. Um, and you could write that better, I'm sure. Uh, so there are some restrictions as the co to the code that you can run on remote hosts. It has to be pure Python. Um, the function parameters are pickled, so uh, you, when you, you are running uh, call as there, you pickle the, the callable uh, that is passed to the remote side. Um, and the return value must be JSON serializable, and the, the reason for that was a kind of security concern that uh, maybe <clears throat> your uh, your, your server gets compromised, you don't want uh, your laptop that is running these orchestration functions to be compromised, um, and Pickle is, is not safe for that. So let's look at some of the things we can build with tunnels. Uh, so I've got tunnels for SSH um, and Docker. So the, these are, this is not like Docker on Kubernetes, this is like spin up a Docker container. Um, by default, it will be a, a Docker container that is uh, destroyed when the, uh, well, in this case, the, the context is left. Uh, so, so here you can see it being used as a context. I think in my first example, I wasn't using it as a context manager. So the context manager closes the uh, connection um, at the end of the context, and of course that means that uh, the, any remote state is torn down. Well, while the connection stays up, of course, you've got a Python interpreter on the other end that could be doing anything. You could be uh, sort of spinning out sort of daemons or doing networking. Um, sudo runs as root or as another user, and local is, is uh, just spin out a, a Python subprocess, um, which I, perhaps is the least useful of these. Um, and if you pass in any of those tunnels to uh, a group, then you can uh, uh, run code on the, you know, in, in, with the tunnels instead of uh, SSH. And so this is an example of using a group to execute code on multiple different Python versions. And I should say for this, you need uh, nothing to be installed apart from chopsticks and Docker. Uh, and obviously Docker will fetch the images and, and run those. Yes. Okay, yeah, typo, yeah. <clears throat> um, so there is, there is, uh, when you're doing this, of course, uh, you are running, so if, you, if you're doing this specific example where we've got Python 2.7 and Python 3, uh, the code that you're importing, of course, has to be code compatible. Um, it's a bit of a fudge trying to call uh, code from, uh, so if you're calling Python 2 and pickling objects uh, from Python 3, uh, then you can expect to see uh, strange behavior where, uh, you know, uh, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. If you're calling Python 2 to Python 3, then you will expect to see stuff in Python 3 that is bytes. Um, and that's, uh, it's, so that's just the nature of pickling. Uh, so, I mean, this is not without pitfalls. Uh, groups as well have the ability to uh, they, they, they act as sets, so um, the, 
you can create, and, and these are not connected at the, the moment you create them. So this is just sort of uh, the all hosts uh, operation here uh, is offline. And then the tunnel is automatically connected to all of those hosts to execute is Ubuntu, uh, which is a function. So you can so you could use you could define in one module all of your hosts, uh, and then you could dynamically select some of those hosts to run operations on. And uh, that's an implementation of is Ubuntu. It's not very good, but it fits on a slide. So let's look at all of the operations that the tunnel supports. This will be the uh, kind of wax on, wax off of chopsticks. Um, so every tunnel supports these operations. Uh, so there's a, like explicit connect, uh, which uh, if you run it on a tunnel, it will raise exceptions. So a tunnel will always raise exceptions when a thing fails. Groups don't do that so that you can get the successful bits and the uh, partition the successful bits and the error bits and do your own error handling. Uh, so put and fetch in particular exist to support streaming of large files. Um, that's because you wouldn't want to pickle the entire thing and store it in memory while it's being transferred. And close, and, and the context manager is for explicitly shutting down the tunnel. Uh, so that's an example of uh, using uh, fetch to fetch a, a file from a remote host and we're fetching a password file, so it's probably uh, Perhaps you don't want to do that, but um, the fetch for a group in particular has some special behavior where uh, you don't want to overwrite the same file for, for all of those hosts. So it's uh, keyed by the name of the host and it will construct a, a unique path to write those files into. Um, apart from that, they behave exactly the same on a group as on a tunnel. Uh, and also note there, there's the raise failures, which is just a quick way of handling exceptions uh, for a group. So, so far the operations we've seen are synchronous. Um, so you make the method call and uh, it will block until, uh, for a group it will block until all of the hosts have calculated their result and sent it back and then it will return you the um, response object which has all of the responses from all of the hosts. Um, to support the parallelism in a group, Chopsticks is async under the hood. Um, so, there is also an API to make use of that, which is called Q, which is my attempt to, to create uh, a synchronous API to sort of deal effectively with the, the asynchronousness. Um, so uh, in, in typical operations, you might just want to speed things up. And so you can queue up a, a ton of operations and say, run all of that. So in this example, um, you can compare the, uh, uh, well, so uh, we're, we're putting uh, different operations on uh, individual tunnels. We, we can send individual operations. So rather than a group will always pass the same parameters to the, the function for all hosts. Whereas in the, in the first example here, uh, we can pass different parameters to, to different hosts and then run them all in parallel. Um, all of those operations incidentally return a, an async result and you can attach callbacks and, and so on. Uh, in the, the second example, you are uh, by passing a group as the thing that you're calling the operation on, it will just do all of those things in par parallel. So that's actually sending uh, each of three files to each of three hosts. Um, and if you can imagine uh, how that affects performance, um, the, uh, because there's sort of variability, uh, and actually there could be a very wide variability if you're sending to different networks, um, then uh, by sort of squishing up all of the, the gaps, the, the version with uh, the queue can complete faster. And I could have made that example a bit clearer, but you can notice in, uh, in terms of uh, time, the, the queue example finishes a bit sooner than the operation with group. And as you add more uh, operations and there's more variability, that would go a lot faster. Um, okay. So, it's live demo time. Uh, Chopsticks also works straight out of a Jupyter notebook. So, uh, okay, that's not, where's my cursor? Oh, okay, this is gonna be really hard because I'm looking up there. Okay, so uh, conference Wi-Fi permitting, uh, I have a, uh, 
I have a, a connector tunnel to, uh, that's, just, that's just one of my servers. Uh, sorry, where's my cursor, yeah. Okay, uh, so that's, sorry, that it hasn't connected. Um, it's defined lazily, so we'll see if it connects when I actually call a function. So that function is defined in a cell. Okay, so that's the number of processes running on that server. Um, so to make that work, there is some special support for uh, pickling um, so, or serializing uh, callables that are defined in under under main. Um, and perhaps you don't need to care about that unless you know what it means, but uh, that is actually sent as source, not as, uh, so normally the imports work by, uh, I request this, this module, uh, send me the code for it, and it uses these, the import system to find that. Uh, in this case, it's just sending the source and anything that it rel relies on, so it knows that that relies on OS. Oh, sorry. So, um, yes, I, I should say, like, this all works with the standard SSH binaries. So I've configured my SSH binaries to have uh, uh, local key authentication, so, uh, sorry, private key authentication, so I am, uh, I can automatically log into all of my servers passwordless. That's also the case in, uh, at, at, in uh, where I work, we have Kerberized uh, SSH. Um, and I should say that Chopsticks doesn't really uh, ha doesn't deal with the interactive bits of uh, SSH. So this all sort of presupposes that you have configured your SSH infrastructure uh, to be passwordless, which I highly recommend anyway. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I wrote Chopsticks uh, last year. I came up with the idea because I was grappling with Ansible uh, and Ansible. Ansible is a, um, it's a great tool for what it's designed for. Um, and I was not using it for that. So, so I started to think of ways that uh, I could do something better. Um, uh, I'm actually going to like talk about Fabric, which I used before uh, Ansible, and that's why I didn't go back to, to, to using Fabric. So this is this is a, a Fabric script, and I think there's probably a couple of imports that are needed to drive this. Um, this is a, 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 a recipe for Fabric that I pulled straight out of a fab file that I've written, um, and you would run this with the command fab upload. So. What you're actually writing here in most of the operations is bash. So almost all fab files are just using mostly run and a little bit of rsync and uh, a put. And uh, bash is fine for some things. Um, it's, it's, uh, if you want to do anything more complicated than that, you get back into territory of uh, dropping a script over and evoking it and um, shipping the results back and parsing out the results. You don't need to do that in, in chopsticks. Um, so uh, compared to Fabric, uh, uh, chopsticks has a lot more flexibility. It doesn't have the, the same kind of execution model. It doesn't have the fab this uh, restriction. You're writing just whatever Python scripts you want to write. Um, also, Fabric is uh, it does have parallelism, but it was much more of an afterthought, so it works by uh, uh, creating a multi-processing pool and running the uh, operations on that. Um, and there is no persistent state on the other side, so uh, your, um, if you do want to rerun things, then uh, your, uh, or, you know, run multiple commands, then you're having to restart uh, a process every time. Um, it's also wedded to SSH, so Fabric uses Paramico. Um, Paramico is a Python SSH library, um, and that means that uh, it can only work with SSH. It's, it is, it is uh, you know, of SSH, whereas Chopsticks um, is, is pretty much agnostic about SSH. It's, it's using the SSH binaries, but um, as we'll see, it's just sort of wrapping those, and it can wrap Docker in exactly the same way. Ansible, um, well, this is not Python. Um, 
This, so this is your main interface to, to Ansible. Um, and you know, people cry about the fact that Ansible is written in Python, but actually it is a programming language written in YAML. Um, and uh, like almost literally, like you can uh, step through the, the sequence of operations here and it will substitute into uh, the, so you can get variables out, you can assign variables to, uh, assign values to variables and then substitute them into the, uh, the next operation. So that's, it's, it's like a much worse bash. Um, the Ansible module API, when you actually get to wanting to write some Python code to extend Ansible, um, this is a little bit more ugly. Um, the, I, I've wrestled with trying to write uh, things for the Ansible API, and it kind of works, but I came to the conclusion that Ansible is all about the YAML, um, and it's not about Python, and I'm a Python programmer. So um, by comparison to those, chopsticks, gives you the ability to write normal, testable Python code. Uh, you can test a function locally, and you can have quite co high confidence that it will just run remotely on a remote system. You can document it. Um, I, I've got a, a project at the moment where I've written a class that I use uh, both uh, locally and remotely, um, so in different parts of the, of the operation. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, as you can see there, no, no deploy step. It's, it's not opinionated. I've used it in, I've used it for uh, writing things from monitoring to, um, it's currently a sort of deployment tool. Um, so there are a range of things as well as sort of op, uh, orchestration, uh, sorry, configuration management kind of operations. Um, so there are really very few restrictions as to, uh, to how you can use Chopsticks, where, whereas with, uh, uh, you know, Ansible, you can only write one script, for example. In Chopsticks, you, can, you have your entire code base available to import on the remote side. So, how it works. Um, there are three tricks. Um, and so, the first trick is to, first of all, we have to get a Python process uh, uh, running on a remote side. Uh, we have to exchange, uh, so it's, it's effectively RPC, so we need to make requests to it, and we need to get responses back, um, and then we need to have it able to import code. So how do we get a Python process running? Uh, well, we can give a, a minus C option and pass like some, uh, uh, a little script uh, in the command line. And actually, because we don't want to send uh, uh, 10 kilobytes in, in the command line. Uh, it, that command line just reads uh, a larger script. Um, and then once we've got the larger script, we're, we're, we can proceed. Uh, so uh, there was a, uh, a file called bubble. So it was actually it was mixed my metaphors. Uh, so I, most of the metaphors in chopsticks were about chopsticks. Uh, this one was like about, about do you remember those um, uh, like putting plastic rubber on a pipe and then you blow over, a, anyway, right. Uh, so uh, we inflate a, a process on the other side entirely uh, with code coming from the orchestration host. Uh, and the, the command line uh, uh, on the, the first example is uh, the kind of command line where um, we, uh, we, we feed it like a, a, a one line version of the, the bootstrap script and then we pipe in the, the full script. Um, and that's uh, prefixed by SSH, so that's, that's just running that script on the remote host, and then because we've got stood in and stood out, I can uh, feed it the, re the requests um, and receive the responses over those pipes. Uh, so the, the first thing that will happen over the pipe is it sends the bootstrap script, uh, and then that bootstrap script changes that pipe into a message passing protocol and it sort of moves the uh, stood in and stood out out of the way um, and then we've got bi-directional communication to the remote host or the, or the remote process uh, which could be on the same host um, and that's the kind of uh, message protocol uh, it's just like a standard binary protocol with arbitrary size data um, and uh, a message type and a request ID for convenience to sort of dispatch it to the right thing on the remote side. Um, 
within that, there are serialization protocols. So the data uh, for when you're uploading a file, that data is just bytes, uh, bytes of the file, and the operation is put bytes of the file. Um, when you're calling a function, the, the data will include the pickle of the, um, the, the code that you're sending. And then the last step is importing code back from the host. And so for this, the RPC goes the other way. So we make a call to the remote host, and the remote host says, ah, in order to unpickle this function, for example, or, or you know, perhaps the function contains an import, uh, I need to import this module. And so uh, there is an import hook, which is, a, is a, a capability in Python to customize the way imports are done. Um, and it will go back to the orchestration host and say, have you got this file? Um, and the orchestration host will send it. So importing on the remote side just goes through this import hook and all imports that of pure Python stuff uh, will just be delegated to the, uh, to the remote host, apart from hopefully the standard library will come from your um, deployment of Python uh, on, the, uh, on the, the remote side. So, uh, having made all of that work, um, I, I've sort of moved on to doing uh, some of the, uh, well, I, I, I've unlocked lots of ideas for myself in how to extend this. And one of the ideas that I had was uh, to enable this kind of configuration. So um, experience uh, at, at where I work uh, suggests that you can run maybe 20 SSH processes in comfortable, comfortably in parallel on uh, one, of our, one of our cloud boxes. Uh, so we have many more hosts than that. Um, it is already possible in chopsticks to import chopsticks and make uh, additional connections. So uh, you can call a function that is defined to use chopsticks and you can, so uh, one of the things that I'm hoping to write is a full proxy for chopsticks that is entirely bootstrapped uh, dynamically. So uh, I, I, there's a project that I'm uh, uh, trying to work on at the moment where I need to connect to 750 hosts. Um, so I should just be able to uh, uh, connect to, say, 20, the, the, like pick 20 at random or define another strategy for connecting to, for, for selecting 20 hosts and connect to them with chopsticks and on all of those hosts import chopsticks and connect to, on each of them connect to 20 more hosts and that's giving me uh, 400 hosts. Uh, maybe like I can tweak the numbers a bit uh, or go deeper. Uh, so spanning tree of uh, uh, connecting to hosts is, is potentially achievable with obviously latency trade-offs trade and so on. Um, uh, and I have wrapped, um, uh, uh, so there's SSH was, was the, the reason I invented this. Uh, I, I, wanted to do something that worked a lot like Fabric and Ansible. And Docker, I just suddenly realized, well, Docker gives me access to stood in and stood out as well to a Python process. Um, and then sudo, sudo gives me stood in and stood out as long as there's no uh, password prompts. Um, so what else? There, I think there are loads of other things that could give me a Python process uh, that is in some other context um, and uh, feed my code to it. So here are the links. Uh, I've got uh, extensive documentation on Read the Docs. Uh, the project is on PyPI and on GitHub. Please star it. I've also got stickers. So if you would like a sticker, uh, uh, there are also some, if I run out, there are some on the, uh, okay, I will open those up in a second. Um, uh, and I will be sprinting on this at the weekend. Uh, with that, I will take questions. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> so first question. Thank you for your talk. It was great. Um, I was just wondering if you, let's say, have an infrastructure with 
the diversity of servers and you're using the SSH tunneling. And it's, it's, if you have different versions of Python running on the different machines, and you may have something not working from some of them, do you manage when you return, I mean, you get the, you know, the, the thing done, do you manage to analyze what's going on on different servers? And do, how do you know that something has failed or? Uh, okay, like so I, I didn't show error handling, um, but I can, uh, if I, I can get a mirror of my displays, and so let's hope this works. doesn't support that resolution. <coughs> so can we try to answer that? Without the projector? Uh, okay, maybe? well, so, uh, I was, yeah. Uh, the, um, so, when you are using a single tunnel, it will raise exceptions. When you're using a group, uh, the result object you get um, uh, uh, contains the successes and the failures. And the failures are, contain a stack trace. Um, and the, uh, so, you, there is no access to the actual sort of frame objects. Um, Uh, so there's no access to the frame objects, but you do get a stack trace. And if you are recursively tunneling, you'll get a stack trace that is formatted. So uh, this stack trace calls this stack trace, or something like that. Um, and so you can you can pick apart what what happened. Um, actually, uh, the responsibility for error handling is mostly on the app that's using it. And Chopsticks is not opinionated about how you might want to surface those errors. Um, so right, the Ansible model for error handling is that when you get to an error on a host, you stop processing that host, um, and like the rest of the playbook will run on it, um, you might want to try and recover. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's more questions coming, right? Uh, yes, thank you very much, that looks awesome. Um, two very short questions. <coughs> um, is there a simple yeah. way to pass uh, environment variables to the uh, environment to which I'm calling, and will this work if the client machine is uh, Windows with the working SSH binary? Um, you cannot pass environment variables, but you could call a function that modifies os.environ. Um, Windows, uh, there is basically no support for Windows. However, the remote side has been written to uh, not use the kind of, ah, uh, not use the kind of async stuff um, that is on the orchestration host. So it would be possible to create a, uh, a chopsticks agent for Windows. Um, I, I, I think if you configured um, uh, your SSH, uh, you configured a Windows SSH server and Python correctly, you might be able to get it to work right now. Um, but the, that, I think that would be a, um, an opportunity for future work. Um, but I don't have anything on Windows, so I, I basically don't intend to do that. Uh, if anybody else wants to contribute, then you can join me in the sprints. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for this awesome library. It's better than ExecNet. In my previous team, we've used it uh, for testing automation, uh, where we pipe stuff through Docker exec. Uh, the one thing that was kind of difficult is that obviously you cannot push closures through because the remote site can never get the, the data that it needs. But perhaps something could be done um, like a snapshot of the variables that the closure needs. What do you think of that? Is that a good idea or what? Um, so I, th I think the, uh, actually the way that the serialization of those uh, Jupyter uh, cells works is kind of similar to that. It takes a snapshot of the globals and the, the method code. I still think it'd be quite difficult to do for a closure. Um, what you can do is, uh, so partials are pickleable after Python 
three point something. Um, so picklables, uh, there was a, there was once a bug where uh, functools.partial was not picklable. It is now picklable. Um, so that there is that. Um, also, you can if you create a class, you could uh, a, a class that is pick, picklable. The instances will be picklable, and a bound method is picklable. So there are there are ways of coupling uh, data to your your callables as well as just sort of passing the uh, uh, parameters when you when you pass uh, when you call tunnel dot call or group dot call. Okay, two kind of I'm not sure if they're related questions or not. First. Um, if I understood you correctly, sometimes functions are shipped over the wire in source code form, and sometimes they're shipped over in some other form. Um, um, what, when do you choose which form, and what was the other form? Uh, okay, so um, in if if your script is running as under under main, it's, uh, actually it's, if it's under under main, the, the callable is is defined there. Uh, so uh, callable dot under under uh, under under module equals under under main. Uh, because those are not picklable by default. Okay. So then you, you do, you, if you can, you pickle the function and that's what you ship over yep. the wire? Yeah. Okay. So my other question is it seemed like you were, you had something very spiffy about how you could run multiple Python versions depending on uh, what you wanted necessarily on the, on the remote hosts, and you even were crossing the streams between two and three. Yep. So um, there are differences, there are very important differences about pickle between Python 2 or Python 3. Um, do, are you just uh, not paying attention to that, or are you very intelligently converting things uh, between the pickle formats? Uh, and, and what about like bytecode differences and things like that? Um, it, so the implementation now, uh, one of the first things it does is asks what's the highest pickle version supported on the remote side, and it will use that pickle, pickle version. So, um, and actually, to avoid some, some problems, when you do it in a group, uh, the, uh, when you connect a group, uh, it will choose the lowest con common denominator pickle version for the entire group. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, More questions coming? Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, my question is a variant of the two previous questions. Um, but, uh, yeah, have you considered uh, sending bytecode instead of the inline source? Uh, code. Um, well, well, we will have the same problems between Python 2 and Python 3, but yeah. maybe it will yeah. go to... to I, I don't think I'm going to try that. Uh, I think there are too many problems in uh, trying to use bytecode compiled for one version of Python with a, a version compiled for another version of Python. And uh, I should say that even when you're, you're not um, in the expected uh, use cases for this, uh, like when, when you... Uh, In the expected use cases for this, uh, I'm trying to do two things at once. Uh, the, you're using the system Python interpreter, so uh, user bin Python 2 uh, or user bin Python 3. To, uh, it actually tries to match the it, Python 2, Python 3 uh, to whichever system Python interpreter um, you have available. So uh, it is very likely that the minor versions won't match. Um, and so uh, the, trying to sort of uh, pass bytecode is, is uh, doomed to failure. Okay, thank you. And one last question is here. Uh, hi. Uh, would you also consider implementing uh, some uh, dummy server instead of SSH server in order to, uh, for example, uh, enable yeah. communication with Windows? Yeah, uh, well, that's, that's what I, that I've already answered that question, but uh, uh, I, I, it's, it's far down my roadmap, it, but it is uh, it's something that I thought about, and the, the code that I have written is uh, sort of compatible with that aim. That's the, that's the answer to the exception handling question. You get a remote exception uh, that has the, so uh, the, these paths are paths, that's code imported from the uh, uh, orchestration host. Okay, thank you so much.